Sick of repeating commands manually? Let PowerShell do the work and learn how arrays and for each loops can automate almost anything. Hey everyone, I'm Travis and welcome to my channel. In this video, we dive into PowerShell arrays and how to loop through them using the for each loop. If you're just getting started with PowerShell scripting, this one's for you. Before we jump in, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video with a friend who's learning PowerShell. Hit the bell icon so you never miss an upload. And if you're looking to level up your skills, check out my courses on udemy.com, including my latest, The Beginner's Guide to the AZ-900. Links are below. And a big thanks to all my channel members. Your support means a lot. All right, let's talk PowerShell. It's not just a command line tool. It's a powerful cross-platform scripting and automation solution. One of the most useful things you can do with it is loop through a bunch of items and perform repetitive tasks. Now that's where arrays come in. Think of an array as a list, maybe a bunch of folder names, running processes, or even IP addresses. You can grab these programmatically and then use them however you need. Filter them, display them, or pass them into other commands. And to work with those arrays efficiently, we can use loops. One of the most common loops in PowerShell is the for each loop. It's super straightforward. You take an array, loop through each item, and do something with it. The best way to learn is to see it in action. So in the demo coming up, we'll walk through how arrays and for each loops work, step by step. It's designed to help you start building your own scripting and automations. There's a link to the code I'm using in the description below. Let's fire up PowerShell and get started. Here we are in VS Code. This demo is going to start out easy and explain things as it gets a little bit more complex. And of course, links to the examples are in the video description below. Let's start with creating a simple array, and I mean simple. The first example will declare a variable and add multiple strings or text items. As easy as one, two, three, literally. And we'll need to run each of these to add them to memory and execute the commands. We can do that by just placing the cursor on the line and hitting F8. If we want to see what's in the array, we just call the variable. And that shows one, two, three. That's what's in the array. We can also find the number of items in the array by using the count method. Three, there's three items in that array. Next, we'll view the array. Again, we can do that by simply calling the array. That shows one, two, three. If we want to see a specific value, we can add an index number between a bracket notation. This example will return the first value, one. Notice that the index starts with zero. Arrays use zero-based numbering. We have three values, indexes are zero, one, and two. We can see multiple values by using a comma between the brackets, one and two with this example. We can get a range with a dot dot operator. This example will return the values between zero and two. That happens to be all the values in this array, one, two, three. What if we need to add or remove values from the array? Let's take a look at that next. We can use the plus equal operator to add an item to the array. Let's add four to array one. Next, we'll view the output. It was added, but that's the wrong four. I imagine there are some people out there who are horrified by this mistake, but it was intentional. Let's fix that by updating the fourth item in the array, that's index three, with the correct four. Let's view it again. That looks better, but what if we want to remove, not replace the item? We can do that with the next command. This will replace the array with a new one that has the same name and all the values except for the one that equals four. So it's taking the existing array and replacing it with another array that includes all the values except four. We'll run that and let's view the updated array. We're back to one, two, and three. Stick with me on this. We have a couple more array topics before we get to looping. It'll be worth it, I promise. An array can store mixed data types. Let's create a new array that has text or strings and integers or numbers. Now, if we call the first item in the array and pipe it into the get member command, it shows the data type string. Let's do the same for the second item in the array, index one. That shows the data type is an integer. So far, we've just been using a single value in the arrays. It can store objects as well. This next command gets all of the folders in the path with the get child command, specifying a file path. Let's run that. And of course, if you're following along, you'll need to update the path for your machine. Now we can see one of the folders with the index number and piping that into the format list command. That returns information on the first folder. We can view all folders in the array by piping the variable into the format table command. 
This example limits what's returned to the name and the creation time. And next, we can see the data type stored in the array with the git member command. The data type is system.io.directoryInfo. We're getting close to looping, I promise. This is the last array example, and it's an important one. We're going to run the git member command again, only this time we're specifying the array itself, not the object in the array. We'll use the input object parameter for this, and array1 as an example. The data type of the array is a system object. So far, we've been creating variables and passing in the data separated by commas. PowerShell knows we're creating an array because we're giving it a list. But what if we're creating an array with just one item or no data at all? Let's create a new array and add the number one. Now, if we run get member again, passing in the variable, it shows the variable is an integer, not a system object. Let's add another number to the array and view the results. It shows three because the variable is an integer. It added one and two and got three. It didn't add a second number to the list because the variable is not an array, it's an integer. We can fix that by declaring the variable as an array. That's done by starting with the variable, then an equal sign, and then the array subexpression operator. That's an at symbol with an opening and closing parentheses. In this example, a one is also added as the first value, but you could leave it empty and just add items to the array later. Let's run that. And then we'll run the command to add a second value to the array. And next we'll view the output. That added the new item to the array as expected. Now it's returning one and two. Let's also take a look at the object type for array three. And that shows it's a system object. That's what we're looking for. Okay, that's an overview of arrays. There is more to it, but this is a beginner's guide and we have enough information to get started with loops. Let's do that next. The first example is to demonstrate looping while creating folders in a directory. And the first step is to create the array of folder names. Notice the name is folders indicating that there's more than one. And as a comment on the screen points out, commas are optional when we add values with multiple lines. If you do use commas, don't add a comma to the last value. The comma tells PowerShell that there's more in the list. So you don't need a comma after the last value. Let's view the array before we move on. Okay, that looks good. Next, we'll use the for each command to loop through each value in the array and create a folder. We'll start with the for each command, then we'll add parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we have the operator of the variable folder in folders. This is telling the for each command that for each value in the folders array, create a single variable named folder and use that for the commands inside the curly braces. The commands for the for each loop are located inside curly braces. The code is using the variable folder in two locations, once when it creates the folder and once when it writes the message to the host. By the way, we use double quotes in PowerShell when we want to use the value of the variable and not the literal variable name. Let's select and run that. Good, it completed without errors. We can see the folders with the get child items command passing in the same path. That shows the three new and the three existing folders. Okay, creating folders is cool and all, but let's take a look at a more complex example. We're going to use the command used in the last video on splatting. I'll add a link to that on the screen and at the end or in the comments below. You'll be able to find it if you want to check it out. And of course, you'll need access to an Azure subscription and rights to create a VM if you're following along. We're going to modify this command to deploy three Azure VMs with different names. We'll start by adding an array with the VM names, demo VM1, demo VM2, and demo VM3. Let's run that to add it to memory. We also need to create the credential object. This will be used for the local admin username and password. We'll run that and create the username and password. Next, the hash table and the new azvm command have been placed inside a for each loop. This will loop through and create a new variable called VM name for each item in VM names and create a new VM. But we need to update the parameters. That's the beauty of splatting. It's easy to find and update parameters. We need to change the VM name to the variable. We can use the VM name variable inside the loop. We're also going to update the name of the network security group or NSG, so it's unique. We'll use the VM name and then append NSG. And we'll do the same for the public IP address. 
And again, we're using the double quotes, so it will use the value of the variable and then append dash NSG or dash PIP at the end. The rest of the parameters can stay as they are. So for each VM name in VM names, it's going to update the value in the hash table and then run the command. Let's highlight and run it next. Make sure you get everything from for each to the closing curly bracket. We'll run. That will build our three VMs. It's going to take a few minutes to finish. The video will pause here and come back once it's done. All right, that finished, let's view the VMs next. We're going to use the same array with the VM names, a new 4H loop. We'll use splatting for the parameters of the resource group and the VM name, and then pass that into the get az VM command, formatting the output with format table to include the name and the location. We'll highlight and run that. And there it is. Those are the three VMs. That is how we use arrays and looping in PowerShell. And that's how you use arrays and for each loops to build your own PowerShell scripts. If you found this useful, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe for more tutorials. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.